Good afternoon and welcome to another session of the ACT's annual conference. Um, our session for the fifth, our theme for the conference is Accelerating Strategic Change. And for those of you who've listened to the various sessions that we've already had today, um, it's very apparent that one consistent message is that there is lots of change and it's happening really quickly. Many of the conversations that, again, we've had so far have been very strategic. And amongst, although, and although interesting, um, the range of the ground that's covered can be somewhat intimidating. And so in the interest of leaving here today with a bit of a plan and um, sanity still vaguely intact, shall I say, I'm really delighted to say that there's a team, I've been joined by a team from Lloyds Bank so we're going to talk about some of the lessons that have been learned from the impact of uh, 2020 on corporate risk management. I'm very pleased to be able to say that I'm joined, oh, first things first, sorry, housekeeping. I always forget the housekeeping. So Q&A, there is Q&A, for those of you all very familiar with this, down the right hand side, please do ask questions as we go along and we'll try and answer as many as we can as we go through. Um, the session is being recorded and will be made available for replay. And finally, please do remember to get involved with social media. Uh, there's a LinkedIn group and tweet using hashtag ACTAC21. So as I was about to say before I got reminded I had to do housekeeping, was that I'm really pleased to be joined today by three very experienced hands from Lloyd's. First of all, we have Colin, Colin McKee, who is Head of Financial Risk Advisory. And he heads that team uh, that provides strategic risk management and accounting analysis to corporate and FI clients. So he's absolutely the right chap to ask all your questions of. Um, Fatma Patel is Director in Large Corporate FX Sales and is currently responsible for managing the business services and Dutch portfolios looking after FX commodities and deposits re requirements for those clients. And then last, but by no means least, because I've heard him speak before and I know how interesting it is, is Sam Hill, who is Head of Economic and Market Insights for Lloyds Bank and um, has spent the last 10, 11 years in various roles as an economist and market strategist. Right, that's more than enough from me. So in the interest of time and getting into the interesting stuff, Colin, over to you. Sarah, thank you very much, as always, for the uh, the introductions, and it's a pleasure to be joining you here again at the ACT conference. Um, to, to everybody listening, watching, um, well done for tearing yourself away from the football and from trying to book the last available camping pitch in, in Devon and Cornwall before Boris tells us that we're all to stay at home for the next month. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, hopefully it should be an interesting session. Um, we, we've called the session Lessons Learned, and, and really... We're trying to do a number of things, I suppose, um, trying to draw out lessons from what's happened over the last 15 months. So to look at how companies have responded to some of the challenges that they faced and, and to sort of talk through which of the strategies they've put in place or which of the, the, the learnings that they might want to take forward, um, given where we are today. So, as I say, in order to understand what risk management lessons companies and treasurers can take out of the crisis, Probably a good place to start is, is spending two or three minutes looking back on what's happened over the past 15 months and what some of the key issues have been. Um, it's, it's quite hard to believe it's actually been sort of 15 or 16 months for most of us. And I think it's fair to say, looking back on it, it's been one of, you know, one of the most challenging periods that many of us have, have ever had to work through. Um, if we look back to the onset of the crisis, which for most of us in Europe, at least, was last March, Companies and, and individuals have had to deal with enormous changes to the way they operate and to the way they live. And to put these places in change almost overnight on a personal level, it's been a really trying time for everybody. I, th I, th I think it's, uh, it's fair to say, having to work from home in makeshift offices. Uh, many of us have had to juggle the challenges of, of homeschooling, the, the joys of homeschooling. Uh, in my case, trying to learn how to teach three young boys a range of subjects from phonics to long division. Uh, training one of the two million new puppies that apparently we have here in the UK, fixing the internet probably about five or six times a day, and uh, not to mention trying to perform a job that uh, remotely that overnight has become probably twice as busy uh, as it was before. 
So really, really difficult times, I think, personally, um, for, for companies, the same has very much been true. The, the level of operational change uh, that companies have had to face has been enormous. And again, the, that, that change has largely been affected or implemented over a period of days or weeks, if, if we think back to the early days of the crisis. Um, so companies have had to work through the challenges of, of getting employees set up to work remotely. If I take Lloyds Bank as an example, um, so testing and scaling up the IT capacity, securing tens of thousands of new laptops, of, of screens, of bits and pieces of office equipment, and getting them delivered to the, the, all the colleagues working remotely around the UK. Um, something probably that's very relevant for treasurers as well, and ensuring that we were comfortable booking trades remotely. Um, and then more recently working through how and when to open up offices and how we can sort of balance remote working with, with in-office working and, and find a way back to some kind of normality. So away from the operational challenges, um, companies and Treasury teams have had to deal with the immediate impact of the crisis on, on business performance, fairly obviously. So for a lot of Treasury teams and, and indeed a lot of bankers, the initial months of the crisis could probably best be described as firefighting. Uh, first of all, for, for many companies and sectors, the main initial impact of the crisis was that operating cash flows dropped off a, a cliff almost overnight as lockdown took effect. As a result, securing liquidity was um, the first priority for, for many, many companies. So for example, drawing down on available credit lines due to initial concerns about bank liquidity maybe, negotiating with lenders to secure covenant waivers or going through similar consent exercises in the public markets, and indeed arranging new debt facilities or issuing new debt into the market to bolster the liquidity positions, uh, not to mention taking advantage of the various government schemes in, in, in different jurisdictions. And if that's the, the financing of liquidity side, then on the hedging side, it's been a, a really challenging time as well, I think, um, th to me, mainly due to two factors. So first of all, the initial market volatility. So the reaction of the markets to the crisis, to the restrictions, to the various support measures put in place, uh, all of that has meant that we've seen some really significant movements in, in asset classes you know, very quickly in the initial months or month of the crisis, and then slightly more slowly, you know, back, back up again, if, if you want to use that terminology. And then secondly, um, trying to hedge whilst dealing with the, the uncertainty and operating cash flows created by the crisis is, is something that many, many companies and many of us have been struggling with as well. Um, so one of the main results of all of that was that lots and lots of companies have been um, have found themselves significantly overhedged on the transaction hedging side of things, where they would hedge forecast sales or purchases that simply haven't happened as a result of the crisis, for example. And depending on which way around the hedge portfolio was, this, this would often mean having to deal with out of the money trades that uh, the company simply didn't need anymore. So there's been lots of you know, public examples of this, but you know, maybe, maybe one generic example is a UK exporter hedging future sales in dollars. So they may have sold dollars forward for, for sterling. And as cable collapsed from you know, pre-crisis at around the sort of low 130s down to 115 in, in, in the space of about 10 days last March, those hedge portfolios would suddenly have been significantly underwater. Or, you know, another classic example is probably an airline having hedged uh, fuel purchases only for crude to fall to about $20 a barrel uh, with their fleets largely grounded. So there's plenty of sort of war stories, I think, of the, certainly the early days of the crisis. And then what do they do as a result? Well, the companies are really faced with, you know, a number of choices, maybe trying to restructure those hedges to push the expiries back to a, a later date when they felt maybe that the cash flows were more certain, maybe trying to roll over the hedges using historic rate rollovers in order to delay the cash outflows, or simply closing out the hedges for, for cash. Um, obviously to do so meant that they would have to have the liquidity available to, to settle the trades. On the interest rate side of things, it's you know much the same story. Companies with longer dated interest rate swaps or cross-currency swaps in place, many of them have seen significant movements in value of those portfolios, e either positive or negative over the course of the past sort of year plus, um, given the market movements and obviously depending which way around uh, those, those hedges were. And again, companies have looked to restructure those, um, those portfolios, either to release cash where um, the trades had moved in their favour or, or to delay cash flows by, for example, extending the maturity of the, uh, the hedges at lower interest rates. All of this obviously had a bearing on, on credit lines, so not only the change in fair value of the hedges, uh, but also the market volatility and what that means for banks' credit models. Uh, the fact that the companies had very probably drawn down on their bank facilities, so increasing credit line usage. And then obviously coupled with the, the drop in operating uh, performance means that uh, meant that for some companies, maybe, you know, credit line became pretty uh, tight. 
And the knock-on effect of that is obviously, you know, when market levels had fallen to a, a point that was historically, you know, probably viewed as quite attractive by a number of companies, um, some of those companies unfortunately didn't have either the credit line or the certainty to enter the market and, and hedge at those levels. So lots and lots of challenges, I think, over the past sort of um, the, the past number of time, uh, the past number of months, I beg your pardon. Um, some opportunities, obviously, as well, as I've, I've touched on with some of the market levels being uh, historically particularly low if you look at interest rates or some of the commodity prices in the initial months of the crisis. Um, and indeed, some of the main FX pairs, depending which way round you are as a, a company or which sector you're in. Um, so plenty of opportunities for people to take advantage of subject, as I say, to, to credit line. Um, so if, if that's a brief canter through maybe the last 15 months, then I suppose the key question is where, where are we now and what can we learn from all of that? Um, well, in my mind, at least some of the key words of the last sort of year are probably uncertainty, agility, flexibility, resilience, things like that. And, and looking forward, at least to the immediate future, I don't really see those key words changing, to be honest. I think all of those things will will be around or those qualities will be needed in, in, in spades um, over the coming months and, and year. Um, with that in mind and focusing on the level of uncertainty and where we are in the markets today, um, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Sam Hill, on the economic side to uh, take us through where we are from a macro standpoint. So Sam, over to you. Thank you very much, Colin. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, and I'll go straight to my first chart in the interest of time. And I'm just going to show four pictures today uh, to try and address some of the main macro market points. And, um, you know, I think the one that I get asked about most frequently these days gets straight to the point, what's happening with inflation? Uh, how much of a risk is inflation to the outlook? Uh, and how should we think about this? And hopefully you can see here from my first chart that um, if you look at core inflation rates rather than headlines, so excluding the volatile food and energy components, this at the moment is very much a US-led phenomenon of higher inflation. Unfortunately, I submitted these charts before last uh, week's latest print, so the US figure would be even higher here at 3.8, but nevertheless, you get the idea. Uh, and I think there's a certain amount of this which makes um, textbook fundamental economic sense in that um, the US fiscal stimulus program uh, has been much bigger than these comparable nations. We've got here the UK, Canada and um, the euro area. Uh, and so, uh, you know, some of that demand led stimulus, um, uh, you know, undoubtedly uh, helping to, to help to, to, to cause the inflation rate higher. Uh, but I think, um, you know, even when we look at that US uh, move to higher inflation, there is a reasonably large amount of evidence to back up the Federal Reserve's view that this is a transitory phenomenon. Um, so whether you look at it in terms of um, the move in the uh, items in the inflation basket that were most affected when we went into um, the uh, lockdowns or the initial virus period uh, last spring uh, and see how those same items are reacting now. Um, it does seem as though a lot of the items that were sensitive it, going into the virus are the ones that are sensitive coming out of it. And so you might say, well, it's very clearly some distortions related to uh, the virus specifically, and therefore we could afford to look through it. Um, you know, or you could look at some other traditional longer term measures of the components of inflation that are historically cyclical and reflective of uh, wider pressures in resource use in the economy. Whichever way you look at it, there is a good case for saying that a lot of the inflation in the US uh, is transitory. And as I say, if we're most worried about it in the US, then there's you know, also this important observation that for the UK and for other places, um, it's not necessarily um, such a uh, major concern. Uh, and to develop that point and move more specifically to the UK on my next slide, uh, here, I think we also need to consider, um, if we're able to bring up the next slide, please, um, the, um, thank you, the, um, where the UK economy is. Uh, and what this chart shows is normalised to uh, the level of 100 before a recession. Um, what is the size of the economy now? Uh, and a lighter green line shows the virus crisis and compared to the darker green line, which is the, um, um, the, the global financial crisis. And then on the horizontal axis, we're looking at the number of months after the pre-recession peak. 
Uh, and again, unfortunately, just the way things have worked out, this is another chart that um, has uh, another data point to add to it since I submitted it. Uh, but I think the main point is that, you know, even with that um, good performance of the UK economy in April, the UK is still around about four to five percent below that pre-virus peak. Uh, and so there's still a long way to go. And, and with that level of slack in the economy, um, it's, um, you know, it makes it harder to argue that uh, inflation is going to be uh, an exceptionally difficult and persistent uh, problem to deal with. So, um, you know, whilst we might see um, the CPI inflation rate rise a little bit above the 2% target in the months ahead in the UK, uh, you know, it's very different even from the peaks we've seen uh, in the last decade or so. A uh, 5.1% year on year, we got to twice, I think. So, um, you know, the inflation dynamic, yes, things are picking up, but from a low level, and it's very far from certain that there's any persistence to this inflation in the UK. Um, so, um, moving on um, to my next slide, I think really one of the main things that we'll be looking at uh, in terms of the performance of the UK economy in the coming months and what that will mean for the policy, the monetary policy uh, backdrop is how the labour market handles the um, phasing out of the job retention scheme, the furlough scheme. Uh, and this chart here shows you the uh, HMRC data on the total number of furloughed employments. Uh, and it's been falling uh, in recent months. Indeed, in April, it came down almost a million, uh, 900,000 reduction, but there are still 3.4, there were still at the end of April, 3.4 million furloughed employments. Uh, and hopefully you can also see the black bars there of the Bank of England's sort of benchmark expectations for furlough usage um, during Q2 and Q3. I think really this is a critical benchmark for um, you know, sort of taking a pulse on the labour market. If the number of furloughed employment stays too high relative to those Bank of England benchmarks, I think the implication would have to be that the uh, level of buoyancy of demand in the economy isn't enough to support um, those um, jobs that are currently furloughed um, without some government support and therefore you might think that if we're slipping behind um, this, these benchmarks then uh, the Bank of England's forecasts are too optimistic. Now as things stand up to this point um, it's been going reasonably well and um, those forecasts have looked on track uh, clearly with um, the potential delay to uh, the last stage of uh, uh, loosening restrictions there will be more question marks over that and it won't take much of a wobble um, for there to start to be questions about what happens next. Uh, but um, having said that, the Bank of England still has got another, around about another six months of, of QE purchases to go. So there's still going to be a good level of stimulus in place. And I think that brings me to my last slide, um, which um, will be my sort of handover point uh, to the next speaker. Uh, and it, that's just really to look at what's happening with bond yields, because I think one of the things that we've seen uh, with um, uh, bond yields, and here I'm showing in the red line at the top, the 10-year US Treasury, the 10 year US government bond yield. Uh, and, um, you know, one of the things that we've seen as a result of rising yields uh, this year um, is that we have returned in out, we did return at the end of Q1 in outright terms to the same level of yields that we saw just before the outbreak of the virus, around one and three quarter percent in that 10 year US government bond. Um, but I won't sort of go through all of the detail at the bottom. Hopefully you can see it and look at it later if you want to. But the difference is that even though the level in Q1 this year was the same as pre-virus, the composition of uh, that 10-year yield was completely different. So the nominal bond yield is uh, made up of at least two parts, one part being how much am I getting compensated for my expectation of the level of inflation in the future. And then once I've taken off my compensation for inflation, I'm left with a real return. Uh, and I think what we've seen is that um, when we got to one and three quarters percent at the end of Q1 this year, much, much more of that um, uh, total yield was a compensation for expected inflation. Um, and, you know, and, the, uh, and the real yield was much lower. Now, there are a number of points to draw out of that. Firstly, um, low real yields provide a great deal of stimulus for the economy. It's easy financial conditions if real yields are low. Uh, and I think the other point here is that um, real low real yields is a reflection of what central bankers are telling us, that they are not going to tighten policy too soon. Um, and in, in exactly because of that, uh, and because of the hint of a little bit of accommodation of higher inflation, 
Um, that's why inflation expectations have got higher. I think one of the very practical conclusions of this in terms of um, you know, corporate risk management is um, that it is consistent with steeper yield curves. Low real rates is low policy rates in the front end and short maturities. Um, but the other side of that, the exact other side of that is probably means inflation expectations a bit higher, a higher term premium, a steeper yield curve. So I think those are some of the points that I wanted to draw out. I've probably used up my time uh, and apologies if I've gone over. But at that point, I'll hand back uh, to Colin, I think. Actually, Colin, before you step in, can I just ask you a question, Sam? Um, yeah, sure. it, it, and it is coming back to inflation, obviously, because it's the one thing that when we talk to corporates that they are increasingly concerned about. And I guess it's a question in two parts. One is that you've made the comment that it feels transitory. Have we got any idea, not, not, not necessarily Lloyd's view, but a market's view? Anyway, I think we were about to hand over to Colin. Um, would you like to pick up and follow on, Colin? Yeah, th thank you very much, Sarah. Sam, I think you dodged that question very nicely. Well, well, well done. Um, so Sam, I, I completely agree, obviously. Um, I, th I, think, I think it's a really interesting time in the markets to be, to be doing this presentation. Um, if I can flick on to our next slide, uh, please. Uh, there we go. So but both in terms of, I suppose, the, the macroeconomic environment that, that you've talked through and where we are in the road to recovery. Um, and then I suppose also from a more micro viewpoint, if you want to put it that way, from the, the sort of rates that corporate treasurers are, are focused on or are interested in. Um, so you mentioned obviously inflation being one of the key talking points and you know what's happened over the past sort of six months. Well, steepening of curves um, is probably the main change, I think, since we've um, since we did this presentation uh, or similar presentation back in October at the last conference. So on this page, if if people can see it, I appreciate the charts may be slightly small. The top left uh, just shows the main swap rates or rather the five year swap rate and some of the main currencies since uh, late 2019. And if we can look at what's happened, obviously, as we go into the crisis, swap rates have have collapsed. So dollar rates, for example, um, were up at you know to almost three percent. If we go back to almost back to early 2019, sterling rates were up at sort of you know 1.4 percent. The crisis led to this collapse of swap rates, the, the convergence of rates between the currencies, and then. As the vaccination programs took effect, as um, economic recovery started to happen and there was perhaps a bit more certainty in the US, for example, uh, the announcements of fiscal stimulus, uh, Biden coming in, et cetera, et cetera. We've seen so swap rates um, tick up over the last six months and in, in particular really over the first quarter uh, of, of this year. Um, so the, the sterling rate, I think, hit a low, the five-year rate hit a low of just 13 basis points, for example, back in August. Uh, of last year, dollar five-year rates were something like 24 basis points, I think, uh, the 10-year rate, 50 basis points. So real historic lows to this sort of slight increase that we've, we've seen today. Um, so again, the, the, the sterling five-year rate stands at about 66 basis points. When I looked earlier today, the, the five-year dollar rate at 85 basis points. And I suppose the question is, tying back to, to Sam's um, comments on inflationary and whether or not it's, it's likely to be transitory, I've tried to draw sort of a red channel uh, on the right hand side of this chart showing how maybe the, the increase in nominal rate uh, was perhaps expected to, to carry on uh, through late Q2. And I suppose the question we have now is, well, has the increase lost a bit of momentum uh, or, or which way do we think rates um, might go next, which uh, to my earlier comments is why I think it's a quite an interesting time to be looking at this presentation. Um, the top right chart then shows short term rates, in this case, sterling. So we have the overnight rates, Sonia, in orange, and then uh, three of the main LIBOR rates. And again, we can see obviously the period pre pandemic um, with the rates being up at, you know, give or take sort of um, 80 basis points. The dislocation in the market that happened uh, immediately after March, so with overnight rates reducing immediately in line with central bank policy, but then the LIBOR rates um, sort of remaining high reflecting, I suppose, a potential credit risk in the banking market primarily. But then if we look at the, the latter half of 2020 and into this year, um, going back to Sam's comments, we see those short term rates really being anchored uh, in line with central bank policy. So all of that has resulted in the, the bottom left chart, which shows in this case, 10 year sterling and 10 year dollar, uh, what we've called a carry. So the difference between the 10 year swap rate and uh, the relevant LIBOR rate. 
so three month LIBOR for uh, dollars, six month for sterling. And the scale of this chart is slightly different. The, the timeline is actually over five years. Uh, why have we done that? Well, it, it's really just to highlight the fact that even if absolute swap rates aren't particularly high at the minute, I don't think anybody's going to say sort of, you know, 85 basis points in, in five year dollars is, is historically a very high rate. Actually, because of the fact that, that the overnight rates, the short end is, is seems to be pretty much anchored at the minute. Um, the steepness that Sam alluded to earlier is quite notable and, and, and that's really been the change that's happened over the last sort of six months or so. So the timeline of five months, you'll see in both dollars and sterling that uh, the current level of carry is really the highest we've seen in five years. And you'd have to go back to the period before that to see uh, steeper curves at, the, at least at the 10 year point. Um, last chart in the page is really just to show that the, um, so this is credit spreads based on ITRAX, um, both for investment grade and sub-investment grade issuers. And, and really just to show the, the fairly rapid normalization um, of those credit spreads and, and the you know return of demand by debt investors that if you look at spreads today, they're very much in line with where they were pre-crisis. If we look at bond market issuance, there's a lot of demand out there. So in some ways, you know, relatively accommodating um, uh, accommodating market rates for, for clients. So what does all of that mean then in terms of um, where companies are today and what they're thinking about? So if I flick ahead to the next slide, Uh, if that's working, there we go. Um, so what, one of the main things we're talking about, at least with, with clients, is trying to take a step back and almost revisit policies. Because I think if you look over the last sort of five years or so, um, on the interest rate side, many companies have maybe skewed their, their behavior or their policies, if you like, towards the tactical end of things. So what do I mean by that? Well, if we think about interest rate risk management and, and fixed floating, a lot of the companies that we talk to will be very uh, highly fixed or will have come into the crisis with a very high proportion of fixed rate debt because of the, the um, sort of continued downward sort of march of, of swap rates over that period. Um, perhaps, perhaps by the exception of, of a period when the US increased. And really, I think the crisis gives people the opportunity to, to rebalance, if you like, and almost to revisit their policies and, and, and in particular the balance between the strategic and the, and the tactical. So on this page, we've put a, um, a very simple sort of case study example, which we did for a, a UK customer. Um, and this was a customer who had been, or which had been very heavily impacted by the crisis. They're in the transport uh, sector. They have um, uh, quite a significant portfolio of long dated debt. As a result of the restrictions, their cash flows uh, dropped off a cliff and are, are still relatively subdued. So they have taken this sort of opportunity, you know, having got through the initial firefighting phase of the crisis, they've taken this opportunity to, to work with us, to work with some of their other banks and to look at their policies. Um, so this just sets out a very simple scorecard of how, you know, I guess we presented that to the, to the customer and how they thought about it as well. Um, and on, your, on the page, you'll see some of the strategic considerations um, so as I said, I think you know it's a good time for for companies to almost sort of um, re relearn what they did of old, or to exercise some of that muscle memory and revisit some of these strategic considerations that maybe weren't to the fore uh, over previous years. So looking at um, certainty of forecasting, obviously that's something that's an area where there's been a huge change uh, over the past year. Looking at whether they believe their business is cyclical or not. Uh, you know, once we come out of crisis what's happened to their leverage, to their credit metrics throughout the crisis, what's happened to their credit rating, you know, are they particularly close to a downgrade, for example, um, or are there certain, certain rating metrics that are particularly stressed? Um, do they have a significant pension deficit? Do they have large leases on the, on the port, uh, as part of their debt portfolio? So all of these things is really going back to first principles and trying to rethink, well, you know, what do we want our strategic policy to be? And then, uh, on the right of the page, we've sort of highlighted the relevance to the client in, in question here, whether we thought each of these factors was you know, high, low, moderate, etc. And then in the middle, we've, we've put a, a fairly crude, I suppose, arrow to indicate whether that might lead you to more fixed or more floating. Um, so that's certainly one way that, that companies can think about their, their strategic policies, so this sort of scorecard approach. But as I say, a lot of the conversations we have with uh, our customers are, are along these lines today. So they, they might open up with something like, well, I know I'm 
I know I'm significantly overfixed, but um, I need to sort of think through what I can do about it and what my policy should be and how I can affect change. Um, so, so that's one area that I think people will take forward from the crisis and, and really sort of focus on over the coming months, um, given this sort of almost crossroads in, in, in markets and where we are with inflation and nominal rates and indeed with the, the, the differential between currency pairs. Um, so if I flick forward from that um, example to the next page, um, what are the current areas of focus? Sorry, just go back one. Um, on the interest rate side, at least, so as, as I've said, the sort of rebalancing between um, uh, rebalancing between strategic and uh, strategic and tactical uh, factors influencing policy. So the two um, areas I've called out on this page: so number one, fixed floating mix, which I've, I've talked about in brief um, on the previous page, and we've also talked about at sort of previous sessions that we've done with the ACT. But this is still very much one of the key talking points that we as a, a bank um, are engaging with our clients on. So again, what are the reasons for that? Well, you know, I've probably alluded to some of them earlier, but you have a lot of companies who have built up um, a high proportion of fixed rate debt coming into the crisis. Throughout the crisis, people have um, built up liquidity buff buffers, either by issuing into the market, by drawing on RCFs, by arranging additional facilities. So all of that has, has led uh, companies to have you know, significant cash balances as well as additional gross debt. Um, a lot of companies are greater than 100% fixed on a net basis. So we, we talked to a company the other day that had, to use broad figures, maybe 2 billion of gross debt um, in a mixture of euros and sterling and 1 billion of cash or 1.5 billion of cash. So obviously and all the cash was in sterling. On a net basis, um, they were very very far beyond 100% fixed because obviously all the cash was in short dated floating liquid instruments and the debt in that case was uh, in the public bond market um, coupled with some leases. So you have this sort of interesting situation I think where um, companies are looking to rebalance. The, the last time we did a similar presentation curves were particularly flat and the response we got from a lot of clients was that well the pickup isn't really there. Um, now with the steepening of the curves then we're seeing a lot of companies coming in and rebalancing the, those portfolios towards uh, floating and you know putting in place significant tranches of floating debt uh, swapping bonds to floating for example uh, for for bank borrowers uh, not swapping to fixed um or indeed you know monitoring the market to see um what the levels are and when they may uh, be in a position to to put on that floating debt that they want strategically um very quickly on the right hand side of the page, again we've mentioned this in previous sessions, but the other sort of main talking point we're having at the minute uh, with companies is around the currency mix of debt. And similar to the last page that I ran through, I, th I think the, the sort of headline here is almost you know strategy versus tactical. And if if we think about some of the factors that influence currency of debt, I've, I've jotted them down in the bottom of the page in the in the little case study. You might have cash flow matching, so naturally servicing your, your debt in particular currencies. Uh, you might look to reduce the cost of funds. So that's probably what we've seen over the last number of years with euro interest rates being particularly low uh, compared to you know dollars in particular, but also sterling. So at one point, I think we saw the interest rate differential 10 years sort of uh, at around 3% between dollars and euros. So a lot of companies have focused on this area and indeed the, the company in the little case study on this page very much focused in this area. Um, perhaps to the detriment of, of balancing their credit metrics, so if we think about uh, net debt to EBITDA, for example, the, the, the company in this page has um, very largely euro debt as the result of a large euro acquisition. It has a, a proportion of sterling and a proportion of dollars, but, but very mainly euro debt. Why are they doing that? Well, they're looking at reducing the cost of funds. Um, they may be saying that's under the banner of hedging net assets. And then on the EBITDA side, the, the dark green sort of slice of the donut is all uh, dollar EBITDA. And actually, if you look at the sterling and, and euro EBITDA, it's relatively insignificant in the scheme of things. This was a sophisticated sort of um, public bond market issuer. They they knew what they were doing. They knew the risks they're running and, and the rewards they're sort of getting from, from having this position in terms of cheaper debt. Um, others we talked to may may not be in that position. So really, the, you know, one takeaway here would be to to look at that policy and make sure you're you're aware of um, your positioning and whether it needs to be revisited. Um, those are a couple of key callouts then on the, on the rate side. So um, with that, I'll probably hand over to Sapna for a quick roundup of FX and commodities. <laughs> 
That's great. Thanks, Colin. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so to the world of FX in the almost post-pandemic world. So the ACT's overarching theme for this year is strategic change. And this is particularly relevant when looking at what corporates could now be thinking about as we return to some sort of normality. Um, so up until now, what we have seen across all sectors and industries is, as Colin said, a level of firefighting. Um, looking at the charts on your screen, um, yeah, they're up. Uh, so looking at the charts on your screen, um, we can see the levels uh, of uncertainty we have been subject to over the last 18 months. Um, I won't go through each of those graphs just in the interest of time, but the uncertainty which does you know indeed continue today um, with that all important date of the 21st of June uh, more than likely to be pushed further out. Um, as a result, what we are now seeing um, is clients finding themselves in a position where they are either under hedged or over hedged on their FX requirements, um, specifically with regards to their transaction related exposures. So the underlying reasons for this differ uh, dependent on the sector or industry uh, category the client falls into. Um, so for example, there has been an element of overhead positions for the likes of uh, airlines and travel companies as their pre-pandemic forecasted sales exposures can typically be hedged out with maturities over the course of several years. Um, with the travel industry taking one of the biggest hits, uh, we have seen two approaches here, um, either that of closing out existing trades entirely or an approach of restructuring or rolling existing trades to future maturity dates where clients have had a view or forecast as to when activity will pick up again. Um, one of the key issues we have seen um, with the latter approach has been the availability of credit lines to clients in this particular sector, um, especially right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, on the flip side, uh, we are also seeing clients being underhedged. So specifically those in the retail sector, uh, with the focus here on supermarkets, um, with heightened sales revenues at the beginning of the pandemic and steady activity throughout, especially when taking into account the pickup in online shopping and delivery services, uh, clients in this sector found themselves underhedged and were keen to address the gap as soon as possible. So have companies turned the taps back on with regards to transaction hedging? Um, so with there still being real levels of uncertainty around cash flow forecasts, uh, the unknown impact of lockdown easing, and the FX market currently being pretty range bound uh, with very low levels of volatility, um, our clients sorry, with very low levels of activity going on, um, to address the over or under hedge positions our clients might find themselves in. Um, it seems as though clients are waiting for key breaks in particular currency pairs and will top up hedges on an ad hoc basis, uh, therefore not really bringing around a significant change or shift in hedging policy itself. Um, so what do we think corporates should be looking at coming out of the pandemic? So in short, it's opportunity, um, the art of the possible when it comes to your treasury policies. Um, as many of you will know, it can typically be quite difficult to initiate or make changes to Treasury policies, uh, especially when they've been in place for many years and you may have previously play, uh, faced reluctance from senior management when suggesting or wanting to potentially review the firm's policy. Uh, however, having been through the last 18 months, um, a lot of corporates now are in a position to look at the lessons learned and senior management are more and more interested in hearing about what can be done differently going forward. Uh, so what should be considered when potentially reviewing and, and making changes to your treasury policy? So looking back over lessons learned here is key. Um, being on our way out of a pandemic, we have plenty of examples to use and reflect on. Um, what we are trying to achieve here and one of the key themes and conversations we are seeing from clients is that building in flexibility is key. Uh, and flexibility can come in various different forms. So firstly, flexibility around the type of product which are allowed to be used within your treasury policies. Um, with most corporates typically having stayed away from using option-like structures, it's worth looking at whether or not there is merit in having them as an available tool. Um, it may even be the case whereby your treasury policy states that if the market goes beyond a certain level, you can then initiate the use of options potentially paying a premium to allow you to have elements of flexibility and protection may be a worthwhile insurance premium to pay in uncertain times. Uh, optionality also addresses other concerns, so such as credit line protection, cash flow uncertainties, and terrorist protection as well. Um, 
Secondly, it's also worth looking at uh, execution strategies here. So the use of orders can mean you can focus on other things going on in your world. So placing a take profit, stop loss or OCO order with a bank can allow you to focus your time on other treasury related activities whilst knowing that your order will be executed at or close to a market level you're looking to achieve. Um, this isn't only good, uh, this isn't only a good tool to have in your toolkit on a day-to-day -day basis, but especially useful in stress times um, when you have less time than usual to completely focus on market movements. Uh, and thirdly, the ability, ability to take advantage of those key market movements. So especially when it comes to obtaining the sign-offs and approvals internally to do so, if your treasury policy still dictates this. So it's therefore really important to ensure you have a nimble government structure in place um, with the details cl clearly set out in your document. So as an example, we saw a lot of this happen in the commodity space at the height of the pandemic. Uh, with oil prices dropping to just under $20, um, there was a keen want to take advantage of this market move and restructure portfolios or layer in additional hedges. Um, this combined with out of the money mark to market movements on existing trades and portfolios and therefore potential unavailability of credit lines, we very much found ourselves in a catch 22 scenario. Um, so by the time clients had the sign off to trade um, internally and came to the banks to then trade, uh, most credit teams were inundated. Um, so having an approach whereby the desire to take advantage of market movements is communicated to the banks as soon as possible is key. Uh, giving your banks a head, you know, the heads up to, in order to allow for credit conversations to happen whilst you seek out your internal approvals, uh, approvals can make all the difference. Um, so having a clear outline within your treasury policy document, laying out the process which needs to be followed to make these decisions when the market moves can actually be priceless. Uh, so we've spoken about flexibility, but in order to actually be able to achieve this kind, this level of flexibility to avoid panic reactions in stress times, there needs to be a significant level of buy-in and support from senior stakeholders within the organisation. Um, so to do this, it's really important, important to remember a few things. So firstly, to stress test all of the scenarios that you are suggesting. Uh, this will show um, senior management well thought out scenarios based on reasoning um, as to why you want to make some of the changes you are suggesting. Um, it's important to have answers to those relevant questions. So what would happen if sterling fell off a cliff? Um, what would happen to existing hedges if cash flow forecasts drastically changed or if sales stopped completely? Um, are there any impact, uh, accounting impacts that need to be considered here? And have near term and long term scenarios been looked at? Uh, secondly, recognize that the key priority for any business in stress times is the ability to have business continuity in the actual and um, in the actual running and operation of the business. Um, it's important to note that other elements such as FX or commodities exposures are likely to fall further down the priority list for those key senior stakeholders in the business. They are unlikely to have the capacity to approve something which has never been brought to their attention or discussed previously. And as such, it's important to communicate this to your relevant stakeholders and therefore emphasize the benefits of having a well-rounded and dynamic policy in place, one which has the parameters and what if scenarios built in. Give them as much detail as possible in answering those relevant questions. So are there any parameters you need to state, um, notional amounts, tenors, uh, max premium costs, for example? Um, and then when in your treasury policy do you start to use different products, for example? So are options now going to be a part of the available product mix? Um, does the market have to reach a certain level before you can use an option product or are options now going to be BAU? Um, does there need to be senior level sign off before using certain products? And if so, who needs to sign those off and how many levels of approvals do you need? Um, so in addition to the senior stakeholder buy-in that you will have internally, there also needs to be a sufficient level of buy-in from the banks themselves. So importantly, how is this achieved? Um, it's really important to keep your banking group updated with any treasury policy changes or additions you might make. Um, what this will allow for is the banks and their credit teams to be aware of the changes in your approach to your FX and uh, commodity exposures. And therefore, they are more likely to extend or keep credit lines available if they can see a well thought out uh, approach to BAU activities as well as crisis scenarios.
And so to wrap up, um, when reviewing your treasury policies, be prepared and uh, having as many tools in your toolkit to allow for maximum flexibility is key. Um, it might not even be necessary. It might not even necessarily mean that you will always use those elements that you have listed out. It just means you have the option to do so. Optionality isn't always a bad thing. Um, we're still in a period uh, where uncertainty is high, so it is definitely uh, the time to get busy with initiating strategic change. Um, worth noting on that point that our financial risk advisory team at Lloyd's are more than happy to be looped in and assist with any analysis or guidance that you might need um, when approaching a review of your treasury policy. Uh, you can get in touch with your primary FX salesperson or relationship director to find out more. Uh, and on that note, on that note, uh, thank you for listening in today. And back to you, Sarah. Thank you very much indeed, Sapna. And uh, I think you summarised it very neatly there in that 2021 feels very, very much like a year where it's a good time to take the opportunity to move back from tactical and revisit the strategic almost whilst we have breathing space. Um, although, of course, given what Sam and several other people have been saying about inflation, be it transitory or not, um, you know, I still feel that 2021 is going to be a very, very interesting year. So I look forward to hearing what you guys say in another six months' time. Um, so that does actually bring us to the end of our time. Thank you all very much indeed for joining us today. Once again, apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, I'm assuming you've got the test card for those of you who are old enough to remember the test card. Um, but more seriously, the session will be available in full and on demand shortly after the end of this session. So please do go onto the uh, website and you'll be able to find it there. Also, as Satna said, there will be uh, Lloyds Bank colleagues on their exhibition stand. Always happy to chat to you about almost anything, including the Euros, as I understand it, because that's definitely not my area of expertise. Um, and then lastly, but by no means least, I'd like to say thank you very much indeed to Colin, Sam and Satna. Uh, thank you all and goodbye.